You may be seated. Sisters and brothers, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Have you ever made a commitment that you later regretted? I'm not going to ask for a show of hands, let alone for anybody to share, but I want us to think about this for a minute today. If you've ever made a commitment that you later came to regret, it might be that the commitment was different from what you had expected. It may be that you were not considering all of the possible outcomes when you signed on the proverbial dotted line. It might just have been that the thing you committed to doing asked more of you than you were able to do. Can everyone think of one? Okay, so now, if you thought of a commitment you were not able to fulfill, that you regretted making, how did that regret feel? If you walked away from the commitment, did you feel relief? If you persevered and fulfilled anyway, did that make you feel good? Or did it make you feel bad? Now, I ask this question not to get us to dwell on those things that we were not able to do in our lives. But I ask this question because I find myself thinking about those disciples in today's gospel who decide to leave Jesus and to stop following him in today's story. We don't know anything about them. We don't know anything about them at all except that they stopped following Jesus. Maybe they started following him in the Galilean countryside early in his ministry. Some of them no doubt attached themselves to Jesus after his feeding of the multitude, which is in the previous chapter. And they have listened as he pressed and challenged them through all of the preceding verses to today. As he reveals himself as the bread of life that comes down from heaven. And then today he says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This, as we might put it today, is a big ask. This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? Many of his followers say, and indeed it is hard to accept. One running argument I have with my Baptist friends, God bless them, is that if the sacrament was supposed to be merely a symbol of Jesus' presence, why did Jesus not explain that to the people who are wavering in today's gospel? Don't worry guys, it's just a metaphor. You'll eat a little bread, you'll drink a little juice, it's not real, nothing to worry about. The church has always heard these words of Jesus as referring to the sacrament. But of course, when he speaks these words today, in chapter 6, there has been no sacrament instituted yet. Jesus has not given his followers the words, this is my body and this is my blood, and the command to eat and drink them in his remembrance. He is speaking in a somewhat mysterious way. And for many of the people following him, this is just too much. They may have been drawn to Jesus for many reasons. Maybe they liked to listen to his teachings about God and living in a right manner. Maybe they were eager for anyone to fill the prophetic role, the expectation that John the Baptist had created. Maybe they were hoping that he would be the Messiah who would set Israel free from her captivity. Maybe they just appreciated the loaves and the fish 
and followed out of fascination and gratitude for what Jesus had done. And none of these are bad reasons to follow Jesus. They are common reasons today. We admire his teachings and his words. Maybe it's a little easier to do this if we don't examine them too closely. We are eager for prophetic words about justice in the kingdom of God. We are looking for political and cultural leaders who will vindicate us, not just who will do things in the common good, but who will make us feel victorious. We appreciate the ordinary human needs that are met by being part of a community. But eat my flesh, drink my blood, what does that have to do with the nice teachings and the liberation of Israel and unlimited loaves and fish, a coffee hour? What is that about? So they depart. Jesus turned out to be someone different than what they had expected. Jesus turned out to be someone different from what they wanted. And I wonder, how they look back on that moment in the months and years ahead. Did they think they had dodged a proverbial bullet? Whew, at least I got out of that weird Jesus business while the getting was good. I could tell some bad stuff was about to go down there. Did they look back on it as a phase? Yeah, I followed Jesus of Nazareth around for a while. I was, I was a real seeker. I was, I was looking to just learn and grow. And, and, you know, for a while I was really into him. And then I, I you know, I just kind of, he took it too far. Did any of them regret leaving? Christianity didn't become a really big deal in this world for quite some time after this incident. Christians were a minority within the Jewish minority in the Roman world. But maybe, maybe some people look back and wish they had made a different choice. People lose their faith, <clears throat> faith for all kinds of reasons, then and now. People drift away slowly or run away screaming. People are wronged by those like me who are given the role of speaking in Christ's place. Or they get fed up with being asked for too much, asked to believe things they can't believe, asked to behave in a way they cannot force themselves to behave. That's a tragedy. Often it is a sin. And a big part of my job and a part of our job as the church is to avoid imposing in this way on people. To avoid adding to their troubles and their burdens. To provide a safe place of refuge for those who want to come back. But the people in the story today, they aren't reacting to a bad pastor or a toxic church or the ugly politics of religion in their world. For the people in the story today, Jesus himself is simply too much. And I wonder if they missed him. If they wanted to recapture whatever spiritual alchemy brought them into the presence of this Jesus of Nazareth and kept them there for a while. But they left. And Jesus turns to the 12 who remain and says, do you also wish to go away? Now, coming from some people, this would be passive aggressive and imperious. Are you gonna leave me too? Coming from some people, it would be needy. Do you also wanna go? Please say no. From some, it would be resigned and defeated. 
you probably want to leave too. And I can't stop you. But I hear it in the voice of a Savior who truly loves the people he came to save, who grieves for their sin and for their lack of faith, but who will not compel and will not manipulate them. A voice of infinite love and infinite sadness and infinite eternal security. He will not begrudge them. They have left farms and boats and families for him, and all of those things can have him back, can have them back. The prophet Isaiah says of the Messiah that he will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoldering wick. Even, even a sputtering, smoldering, just about to go out wick, the Messiah will not just stamp out. And even a bruised and useless reed that can't even stand up on his own, he will not break. He will not harm or damage or crush the faith of anyone. He will not scorn or attack the wavering. He allows them to leave freely. Twelve true followers. One true follower. Zero true followers are better than an army of people who have been bullied or, or coerced or tricked into his service. Do you also wish to go away? It's a word that hangs in the air of the whole Christian life. Peter, St. Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, he even tries to change his answer when Jesus is arrested. Oh, I didn't know the guy, never met him. No idea what any of this is about. In that moment, he also wants to go away. But in this moment, today, he says the right thing. Speaking for all the 12, as he often does, Peter says, Lord, where else can we go? Who else can we go to? You are the one who has the words of eternal life. There are teachers of wisdom in the world. There are prophets in the world. There are political leaders who will fight for you and vindicate you in the world. There are fishes and loaves in the world and there are farms and fields and families, but there is only one Jesus. There is only one who gives his flesh and blood, not just to suffer, but to be shared, to give life and grace. There is only one who asks them not just to do what is good, not just to do what is right, but to do what is glorious. There is only one who asks them to believe, not just in miracles, not just in God, but to believe in the power of God for them. There is only one who allows them freely and fully, who allows them without reservation to say no, while also praying to his Father with all his heart that they will say yes. Amen.